Good evening. My name is Brandy Parisi. I'm a host and producer at All Classic Old Portland. Thank you guys all so much for coming. So this is my first concert conversation, so uh, bear with me and we'll get through this together. I was also warned by Robert McBride that every now and then, apparently, Carlos might be running in at the last minute, so, uh, and there he is. Speak of the devil. How are you? All right, happy Halloween. Oh boy. Oh boy. Now you have a little one. I, see I have a little up. one, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's 22 <laughs> months. Is he gonna be dressing up on Monday? Uh, the great thing is that I'm not at home yes. because I am here yeah. and because I actually don't like that. <laughs> because I always think, uh, don't go trick-or-treating because I have to take away all your treats. Oh. It's not good for your teeth. That's true. I know, I'm an obnoxious <laughs> father. <laughs> and then you're the, you're the bad parent. I'm the bad parent, I'm the bad, yeah. but, well. And plus, you've got this great program. Yeah. For Halloween, in part. Yeah, it's part. kind of a little unusual for Halloween, yeah. don't you think? I <laughs> well, the barber is sort of this lyrical mystery that sort of jumps out in this very dark and spooky program. But you have these two big pieces flanked by kind of smaller but still powerful pieces on either side. Let's start with the Prokofiev. This, is a, this <laughs> isn't a piece performed all that often with a really interesting history that begins with an opera. And Prokofiev didn't have a lot of luck in his life with getting his operas performed. No, actually, this is another one that he didn't hear ever, which, if you actually read what the opera is about, <laughs> you actually understand it. And on top of that, um, you will realize, uh, because the music of the symphony is very strongly related to the opera, you will realize that probably considering the texture of the orchestra, it's, in, it's likely to be impossible to sing. And it's uh, the main character of this opera, uh, a woman, Renata. Uh, that's one of the most challenging roles that you can even find in the repertoire. It's horribly difficult. And in a way, I think, well, there are a couple of really dreadfully difficult roles in the repertoire, but they are all uh, famous operas. So you learn it, you sing it, you survive it. And then the opera, other opera houses call you and you are allowed to sing Elektra by Strauss over and over or the Brunhilde in the last opera of the Ring Cycle or is all, well, you know, they're, they're really tough ones. The big ones, yeah. But Renata, I mean, it's, uh, I, of course, if I would be a singer, of course I would go after this work because it is, it is, I like challenge. And of course, I like also stories that sound like, uh, or plots. I like plots that sound like Stephen King and has this written. Is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, cool. it's not crime. Uh, meaning, uh, the, the, the biggest hits kind of in literature <laughs> are somewhat sex and crime. Crime, there is not in this opera, but uh, sex, oh yeah, it's alluded, never, nothing happens, but the story has something to sure. do with it. So enough of this talking around <laughs> like elephant in the room. So what you will experience is actually a little bit of unusual music in terms of Prokofiev, because uh, I would say that we all know Prokofiev from Piano concerto number three, Romeo and Juliet, maybe one or two violin concerti, the classical symphony, symphony number five. All music that is highly rhythmical, um, but very harmonious in a very weird way, because Prokofius is a little bit strange how he writes. Um, and in this case, all of that with few exceptions in the symphony is gone. 
rarely in the music history you will find music that is so in your face, like this one. I mean, if you, you will experience something tonight that is quite outstanding because you will hear first five and a half minutes of Janacek that you probably have never heard before, and it's quite energetic music. And then you think like, okay, and we all on stage are already like, <laughs> you don't know Just what wait. is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why this music is so in your face, so eerie, sometimes really dissonant on purpose, has something to do with the opera. The Fiery Angel is actually an uh, opera this, uh, the, where, although the symphony is independent from the opera, you have to, or it helps to understand why does this sound the way it sounds if you know what the opera is about. So, Renata, a young woman who in her childhood had many visions of a fiery angel. And now she is 17, 18. Late teenager. Yeah. Late teenager. And she wants to do with the angel what the birds and the bees and the flowers, and, uh, well. The opera is not staged very often, <laughs> for a reason. <laughs> and the angel is repulsed by the uh, idea and uh, pretty much disappears, with, but leaves a hint and kind of leaves her with the idea that one day he will come back in human form and then they will be true lovers. And to cut the story a bit short, she spends pretty much two acts looking for the man. <laughs> um, and she even gets into a long-lasting affair with somebody whom she thinks is the angel, and guess what? He's not. And uh, that, of course, everything falls apart, desperation, and then she retires uh, in order to live in a convent. And in this convent, many very strange things happen. And the nuns accuse Renata of actually having a relationship, loving relationship of sorts, with the devil himself. And the ending of the opera is a mass exorcism fren frenzy. All the nuns go bananas. <laughs> and in the middle is Renata, who, by the way, uh, that's the end of the opera, is being sentenced by the Inquisition to burn on the stake. Happy ending. <laughs> so you understand, it's kind of a harsh opera. And maybe... The, there is an, and maybe we can understand it a little bit if we on one side understand that Russian composers have a very great love for stories that are darker and stories that are literally based. Um, very not long before this opera was actually even conceived, uh, was Shostakovich Big's opera, uh, Lady Macbeth of the M district of Mzensk, which is purely sex and crime, nothing else, in a very rude way. And uh, so, in a way, it's not surprising that... <laughs> and, and Prokofiev, this is not his first attempt at opera. His first big opera was The Gambler, based on Dostoevsky. So, the Russians seem to have a good a nose for what really works as a literary basis, but they have they seem to have a very bad nose in terms of what can we stage <laughs> safely and what not. And I have, since in this opera, you probably have to stage it in a realistic way, well, good luck. Uh, so you understand why this opera is not the most successful. In case you anywhere in the world uh, find that opera as being said, I, I really urge you, run and see it. It's a masterpiece. It's just quite massive. So, based on this, there is a 35-minute symphony, 
for movements. The symphony does not follow the plot. So it's not the ending of the symphony is the ending of the opera. Surprising, actually, because the ending of the symphony, you really think everything goes to hell. <laughs> but that's not how the opera ends. The opera, the ending of the opera is the ending of the third movement, and then comes a fourth movement. So the, it, you will hear music that is very, like, aggressive. And since we are talking about um, love affair that goes completely wrong, there is also this lyrical, peaceful music, which is the second movement, beautiful music. And um, you will hear a lot of interesting colors that come out of an orchestra. Especially, I urge you to observe th what happens in the strings in the third movement. Because if I could isolate, let's say, three, mu three minutes of music and just play those three minutes of music to you and say, name, the compo name even the century. Name the composer in the century. Nobody who doesn't know this piece will get it. Because you think it's 21st century, and you think it's, it's one of those completely crazy composers, yeah. it's Prokofiev. Yeah. It's Prokofiev a little bit on the wild side. <laughs> well, and you and I were talking about this about a week ago, about this piece, and how this is really unusual Prokofiev, but I've read since then that the composer himself felt that this was one of, if not his best symphony. He loved this work. He absolutely adored it. Actually, the more you get into this piece, the more you like it. Mm. Because not only you all of a sudden realize, the thing as an interpreter and as a musician that you first realize is the sheer power. And you're like, whoa. The, the, and then you look at this thing that I told you about the third movement and you think like, what? <laughs> And then you start figuring it out, and you, then you look at structure, and then you realize, wait a second, it's very also well-crafted, and it's really the work of a genius. I understand why Prokofiev himself really liked the work. It's a, an absolute masterpiece. It's just not as pleasant as Symphony Number no. 5, but that doesn't diminish its value. Uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, I believe that composers very often think their best work is something that we, as listeners and interpreters, we don't play that often. Mm. Uh, this is, for me, this is not, not so shocking that he, di he didn't say, well, my Roman Juliet is my opus maximum. Mm, yeah, it's, it's sublime music, don't get me wrong. But the fact that he loved this one, and it's not played so often, yeah, you'll hear it. You, you, you'll be impressed. So we have this opera, then symphony, inspired by this spooky, kind of dark story. But the piece by Janacek that you alluded to, that you're opening with, also inspired by Dostoevsky, yes? Oh, yeah. Have you read? Uh, is is yeah. Dostoevsky being read? Some. Some. Yes. Uh, Karamazov. Yeah, yeah. Prov yeah. Probably. Karamazov and Nets from Underground. And yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this is based on uh, Dostoevsky's From the House of the Dead, which is a semi autobiographical novel that he wrote after enduring the pain of uh, being sentenced to four years in a prison camp in Siberia which he survived, not well, but he survived. And he then wrote this novel. And Janacek, uh, based on this plot, constructed an opera, which is a very unusual piece because it doesn't have a real plot. You know, in operas, even in The Fire Angel, you start, there is something going on, and it ends. And in uh, House of the Dead of Janacek, it's a lot of little stories, but it's not like a continuation. This person tells you about this. Here is 
a brawl here is that what happens in probably uh, prison camps in Siberia. And um, on top of that, Janacek has an astounding way of writing music. Uh, if you come to this pre-concert talks, you heard me saying this over and over, and I never get tired of saying this. Every great con composer there is has a language, finds his language that is very distinctive. You ha hear Richard Strauss, and even if you don't know the piece, you think, ah, Strauss. And it's likely that you're right. You hear Mr. Mozart or Mr. Bach, and you kind of hear, uh, sounds like Bach, probably the greatest music ever written. It's that easy. And Janacek is one of those. His motivic skills, utilizing little snippets of melody and constructing something along that, together with his highly coloristic element, is actually astounding. So you're in for the prelude to this also very dark opera. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very, it's in a very different way, powerful. Mm -hmm sensing a theme here, definitely. Fiery, powerful, but then intermission, and we come back and it's pure lyricism courtesy of Barber, but a piece that also was not without controversy when it was composed. Yeah, I think by now you will ask yourself, so why are they playing this for our Halloween concert? <laughs> <laughs> well, look at it from two angles. First of all, um, Despite trick-or-treat and uh, decorating your house and garden with all these wonderful things, uh, despite that, the origin of Halloween is probably very serious, spooky and dark. So just think of it that way. And the other way to think about this program is, well, trick-or-treat. Trick is the first part. Now you, <laughs> after intermission, recover and you get a treat. In Joseph Swenson. <laughs> with Joseph Swenson, who is an... He's not only a, a wonderful colleague and violinist, he's just a great musician. So, of course, the Barber Concerto was not without controversy because this was, this was a commission. Um, and it was commissioned by a very rich American gentleman for his... Uh, adopted son who was a prodigy in the violin and uh, he uh, commissioned Barber for what was at that time a fairly large sum of mon money, half of it up front, half of it afterwards. And the legend says, and said it for 30 years, that he finished his first two movements and the soloist was like, eh, not so hard. And then he wrote his last movement, and the soloist said, oh, that's so hard, I can't play that. And then this, the, the premiere of <laughs> uh, everything got very, very complicated. There was a kind of mock audition to prove the point that actually the last movement is playable. And yes, it is playable. It's difficult, but it's playable. And uh, this uh, young prodigy has to, had to relinquish his rights to be the first performer. That's a legend. The reality is, tells us that this is partly true, but not entirely. It was actually <laughs> this prodigy later in life gave up the violin and took up his uh, adoptive father's business probably financially a very good idea. <laughs> and uh, he, in the 80s, accounted his own story about this concerto, and he said, you, look, I heard this, I, I looked at the entire concerto and just felt that the last movement is too light, too, doesn't have the substance that the first two have, and also is very disproportionate because the concert is 25 minutes long, 23, something like that. About that, yes. About that. And the last movement is 
four minutes. It's very short. And so the soloist said, I actually didn't like that. And that's why I simply said no to it. But of course, the story with the legend that he couldn't play the last movement is way more fun. So let's continue <laughs> telling that. And I always, um, and I think I'm not the only one who absolutely adores this concert. This is, I don't, I always look at, at uh, you are American and think, okay, Brandy, what do you think is American classical music? Not in terms, or to be more precise, what does American music, classical American music, what does it include? What, what do you think is it? You and I, when the Oregon Symphony released their most recent CD, uh, I guess it's been a couple of years now, maybe a year, um, the American Plains. And we talked about, you know, how we tend to think of Aaron Copland immediately and the sweepingness of, of, of Copland. But I think the lyricism of Barbara is every bit as much uh, what American music is. And that's exactly for me the point. Yeah. Because for me, as if music would be so simple, American music has two components. One is very rhythmic. I mean, anything from folk to jazz and a couple of others is in the American music the way I understand it. And the other is what Copland does so well, and Barber in this concerto does so well, is you start the piece and you feel a vastness that people like me who come from a country and lived for most part of his life in a country that is way smaller than Oregon, uh, we actually don't know what that is. And I, I always like to think um, about the, this idea of when you have, I mean, you all have, but I, until four or five years ago, haven't visited the Midwest, meaning I'm not talking about the cities. Yes, I have been there in everyone. But the Midwest were plains, the corn, <laughs> we feed America and the world, by the way, too. And you have to see that. And then you understand a little bit of how gigantic this is. And when you hear music, Copeland in part, Appalachian Spring, one of the best, or the violin concerto by Samuel Barba, that's the, what I feel. It starts and I feel like, I can breathe, and it's, it opens everything. And on top of that, Barber, although at that time a young composer, was really an absolute genius. And uh, he never left this, this ability of writing lyrical pieces in a way that nobody else could. So you are going to hear a mostly very lyrical first movement, an even more lyrical second movement, and then, well, fast and seat belts, and off we go <laughs> for 300, three and a half, maybe four minutes of madness. And then the piece is over. And that perpetual motion rounds out the violin concerto. I'm curious, I want to get back. These are pieces that clearly, you know, Copland and Barber, you would have known before you moved to the United States. And I think you are so eloquent in, in illustrating how they, they do such a good job. But did you feel, you heard the music first, you knew the music, then you moved to the United States. Did you have this moment of looking out, you know, when you moved to this beautiful state that we live in, and saying, yeah, they got it right, or this wasn't what I really thought of when I heard these pieces of music? Well, first of all, it was always what I really thought, but you are, you're giving me at least partially too much credit. Ah. <laughs> because, so the interesting thing, which has nothing to do with tonight's program, but uh, it's the truth, is I studied music in what is, what is considered the navel of classical music in Vienna. I'm a graduate from Vienna University and blah, blah, blah. We in Vienna have absolutely no clue about American music. None. I re when I was 
way, way younger than now, my experience with American music was limited to West Side Story and <laughs> maybe one piece by Copland, which was not his symphony number no. three, and that's, I ah, yeah, and Adagio for Strings, that we know. And that's it. And then you come here and you experience, like I had the honor uh, and pleasure to do, you experience not only the vastness of the country and the amazing people who live here, but you also realize, whoa, there are a lot of composers and a lot of really good. And then you, you since I uh, am the music director in an American orchestra and I'm the music director uh, in an American festival, well, uh, I'm a real champion for American music, which is also proven the point because we have, uh, we just released the first American CD and the second one is in the works. And I'm very proud of that. It's wonderful, something to look forward to. Maestro Carlos Calmar, thank you so much. We have to, I have to see. Be They're giving me the notice over here. Do I have one minute? Okay, good. One minute to talk about Bach. Bach? Okay. okay, Bach. <coughs> well, the great thing about Bach is when I consider that there is a heaven in music and all the composers are way up there, on the top, the penthouse. Half of the penthouse is Mozart, the other is Bach. <laughs> Please disagree. We can discuss that. <laughs> And Bach writes this toccata and fugue and it disappears pretty much as everything else that he writes for a century. Nobody knew that it even existed, nobody cared. Until another composer took it up upon himself to rediscover Mr. Bach and that somebody was Felix Mendelssohn. Without Mendelssohn, we actually probably wouldn't know that Bach is the biggest of all. And then there is Toccata uh, and Fugue in D minor, probably his most famous piece, in an orchestration by Stokowski that is really over the top, but very intelligent and very fun to listen to. Wonderful. Thank you, Carlos. Two more concerts, tomorrow and Monday. Tell your friends it's going to be a great concert. I was talking with the guys backstage. You guys performed in Salem last night and brought the house down. You guys are in for a real treat tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you.